horses and you only two of the wardens would uh, take this thing around to take the prisoners here, but it was also removed the dead. If you were found inside of your cell and you were pronounced deceased, your body was ultimately removed and brought downstairs to the first floor of the building, or what we call on the tour of the basement. Your body was left there for about three days, and that was to see if a relative came by to claim you. It was also cut back on the stench. Three days, though, that's a pretty short time period, and normally due to the overwhelming amount of bodies we had, sometimes it was close to six months before your relatives were notified of your passing. Um, you were far off the ground by that point. Three days come and go, and the bodies are removed, stacked in this device, kind of like logs of firewood. Once we got about halfway full, that's when we decided to drive it out to the, uh, to the river. We always drove it out at low tide, just to make sure the mud was exposed. Back it in, allow all the bodies to slide out and sink. We continued this tradition up until 1908. What changed in 1908 is the state of South Carolina reversed the law that was established in 1785 that said we could not have cremation. So in 1908 they said you could have cremation. So the bodies no longer went to the river, they went to be burned with the remains of the trees down the wood mill. This device sits out here tonight. If you want to after the tour, you can come up to it, you can touch it, you can take pictures in front of it. Please don't try to climb it or scale it. It's rusty, it's old. Don't honestly know how stable the whole thing is, but that's why I stand closest to it. <laughs> You guys take a look at the building itself. There are two different buildings we will be witnessing tonight. The architect is going together actually puts two buildings together so flawlessly most people don't know when we transition from one into the other. The, um, the square off building I mentioned opened in 1802. Optical building opened in 1822. For 20 years go by, the city expands. The population has risen, but so is the crime rate. The Optical building was a lot larger. The Optical building actually used to have a fourth story and a two story watchtower on the roof, but Neither of those exist because on August 31st of 1886, a 7.3 quake came through and hit Charleston. Now, the quake only lasted a few minutes, but you can imagine the chaos. The guards awoke from their dreams, went ahead running through the building, grabbing prisoners left and right, tossing them out here onto the ground. And it was said that the tower actually became weak, fell in onto the fourth story, killed a couple of dozen people. Now, as most of the inmates were watching this tragic event, they also realized that part of the wall behind me actually fell down and 168 prisoners just took off as fast as their legs go and ran as far away from this building. We know 168 prisoners are only mass escape. The guards did not go looking for these prisoners that night because their purpose that night was to forcefully convince 250-something prisoners back inside that building for the night. And uh, they did it at least. But as I said, 168, only, uh, only mass escape. <coughs> now, there were several ways you could talk to the guy here at the jail. Uh, one that's pretty traditional is being executed. We had executions almost daily at some points at this jail. Our gallows no longer exist because Hurricane Hugo decided to stop on by in 19, uh, 1989 to kind of knock them over for us. But the gallows, uh, I can show you the site where they once stood. Now our gallows were set up differently than what most of y'all are probably imagining at this moment. They're called private gallows. The purpose of the privacy part was that your relatives were the only ones who watch it, your family. It wasn't actually to witness your execution, it was to take your body after your death. I'll show you the site. used to stand right about here. Uh, we know this because of pictures taken prior to Hugo. And our gallows, as I mentioned, are set up differently. What most of us think about when we mention the term gallows is they thing that we've seen in the movies. Staircase platform, trap door. And those gallows are public hanging gallows. Uh, normally very poorly designed, put together in a pinch, usually for a large ride of people to watch someone be executed. 99.99% .99 of the time, something would break. The floor, floor wouldn't fall out, the roping wasn't too tight, you name it. And so it wasn't a really great sound structure. We needed something that would be permanent here on the ground. So we went ahead and modified the gallop. We took out the platform, sent the scalping up to 30 feet high, added a pulley system and a weight. We called it a weight-bearing model. We weren't using your weight to kill you. We were using someone else's huge, solid weight to drop into a five-foot well. On paper, this seems like a great idea. Drop the weight that can go up, neck will break. The problem is this works under one condition. You weigh right around 150 pounds. If you weigh under or over by a significant amount, this could be disastrous. So let's say you weigh under. The weight drops down quite quickly. The victim's going to be risen up in the air like a rocket ship. And normally the rope's going to catch in that pulley system, tightening the rope around the neck so much that it's going to actually pop the head off the shoulder blade. Instant decapitation. On the other hand, if you weigh over 150, the weight just moves down the well slowly rises you up in the air, dangles you like a fish, and kills you through, through slow and painful suffocation. Longest on record, supposedly, is over 40 minutes. 
We never actually redid a hanging here at the jail. And the last time it was used on our grounds was in 1911. In 1911, the last man to be executed by the state of South Carolina through hanging was right here in Charleston. The man by the name of Daniel Duncan. Daniel Duncan was 17 years of age and convicted of murder here in the city. And the story is that he walked into a tailoring shop down on King Street, went to go get a pair of pants tailored. When he walked in, he happened to see a trail of blood, and of course, curiosity got the best of him. Followed it around, saw the tailor stabbed several times in the chest and throat. He knelt down next to the man to see if there was any life left, and when he realized that the tailor was dead, he did what any normal individual would do. He panicked. He wanted to run out of this building as fast as possible, go home and scrub the blood off his body. He ran out, of course, but unfortunately, Mr. Duncan did not realize the shoemaker across the street happened to witness him walking in very calmly into the shop and come running out covered in blood. What would you think? Mm -hmm. Probably the exact same thing the shoemaker did. So, of course, the cops were called. They caught up with Daniel two days later. And at trial, they found him guilty under very minimal evidence. They used the bloody clothing against him as well as the eyewitness, quote-unquote, of the shoemaker. But the real underlying reason why Daniel was to be executed as a murderer here in Charleston is because Daniel was 17 years of age and black. The victim was white. The racial tensions in Charleston were still quite high. So he was sent here to our jail for six weeks, labeled as a murderer. Now, on the day of his execution, his parents were here. It was said that Daniel was probably a uh, only child. They sobbed uncontrollably throughout the entire duration. And during those six weeks, Daniel had a chance to get his mind set into a calm place to mentally prepare himself for his execution, try to keep a brave face on for both his mom and dad. Unfortunately, though, when the day of the hanging occurred, Daniel weighed over 200 pounds. Mr. and Mrs. Duncan watched their only son gasp for air and finally succumb to death after several minutes. His body was taken to a potter's field right off the meeting street. His parents were not wealthy by any means. They could only afford to go ahead and buy a plot, no headstone. So the next morning, the paper, had a huge front page article about Daniel's execution. And it was said that the real killer read that article. He felt so overwhelmed with guilt that this young man had to die because of his actions. He turned himself into the police. The police realized they had a huge problem on their hands. Daniel was executed the night before, and this man is giving details about the crime that the police didn't even know about. So of course, they're gonna have to correct something. Well, the real killer is sent to Columbia. He used to be electrocuted, uh, sent to the electric chair for his crime. And the Duncan family, although many would say the police department had to apologize, technically in those days they really didn't have to. But the arresting officers felt really guilty about what happened. So out of their own pocket, they went ahead and pulled money, just enough to buy a small headstone for Daniel's he gravesite. Had it engraved and placed it on top. Only says his name, supposedly the, uh, the date of his death. It's unfortunate to know that Daniel's story is one that many will hear throughout many jails. Plenty of people have been stuck behind bars innocent, and we believe that Daniel's spirit is actually still here on our grounds. Some of the students will even claim to feel his presence, but it's not a scary presence, more of a calming sensation. But Daniel is here. He's here for a reason. He's here to protect those who are innocent just like he was, hoping that they will not end with the same fate. But of course, I do not mean to tell you any depressing stories of the innocent, because from here on out, I will just strictly be speaking about only the guilty. Let's head inside.